Romans 15, 14 to 33, and I'm reading from the New English Translation, and the title of this section in my Bible here says, Paul's motivation for writing the letter, but I myself am fully convinced about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another, but I have written more boldly to you on some points so as to remind you, because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, I serve the gospel of God like a priest so that the Gentiles may become an acceptable offering, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So I boast in Christ Jesus about the things that pertain to God, for for I will not dare to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in order to bring about the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of the signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem, even as far as Elystrium, <laughs> I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And in this way, I desire to preach where Christ has not been, not, not being named, so as not to build on another person's foundation. But as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is the reason I was often hindered from coming to you. But now there is nothing more to keep me in these regions, and I have for many years desired to come to you when I go to Spain." For I hope to visit you when I pass through and and that you will help me on my way, on my journey there, after I have enjoyed your company for a while. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For Macedonia and Archaea are pleased to make some contribution for the poor amongst the saints in Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do this. And indeed, they are indebted to the Jerusalem saints. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are obligated also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, after I have completed this and have safely delivered this bounty to them, I will set out for Spain by way of you. And I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of Christ's blessing. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, to join fervently with me in prayer to God on my behalf. Pray that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea and that my ministry in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Now may the God of peace be with all of you. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, this is the chapter before the last um, of our study in the book of Romans. Um, um, (coughs) The passage that um, Andrew read to us is part of a larger discussion, as we've been discussing, um, especially from chapter 12. Paul is emphasizing, is explaining, is describing 
to the church in Rome about the practical part of the gospel, what he has been teaching from chapter 1 up to chapter 11. Now we have the practical part of it. And as he comes to an end, he is echoing the main themes some of them we studied, which he referred to in chapter 1. And if we go back a bit and stretch our memories about a year ago when we started uh, teaching this book, we find, for example, in chapter 1 that he tells them how much he wants to visit them. 15, we find that he is repeating that. We find in chapter 1 that he is thanking God for them. Chapter 15 and in 16, he is commending them. Chapter 1, we, sp we, sp we find Paul speaking about his apostleship to the Gentiles. We find this also repeated in chapter 15. Back in chapter 1, we find that um, he is informing the church that he and his colleagues pray for them. Chapter 15, he is asking the church to pray for him. Also, we find a reference of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1. And in chapter 15, we find again two references about the importance of the Holy Spirit and the work of sanctification. Obviously, we had a long chapter in chapter 8 discussing this uh, topic. We also... We find Paul speaking about the power of the gospel in chapter 1 and in chapter 15 and 16, he refers to it again. So we see that whatever Paul said in chapter 1, he's got an introduction. Now he's got a conclusion and everything else in between is sandwiched between these doctrines. There are others, you know, but um, this is just to give you an idea that why this is called, this is referred to as the most systematic theological book that we have um, in the Bible. The point is this, why all this theology and what is now Paul saying this theology means to the church? And that started in chapter 12, where it started that we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. We found that in chapter 12, God gives us spiritual gifts. He gives us spiritual gifts that are work, work out of the Holy Spirit, and he, give, he gives us administration gifts. Everything is to be, to be done for the best of the others, to help others grow, to serve one another. We also find that uh, as a church filled with the Holy Spirit, with this gospel of grace, then we are to take care of each other, we are also to have a relationship, good relationship with one another, with the government, and also with our enemies. So the gospel has this power, has this power to make us live a life that shines the grace of God. This is a book which is weaved in the grace of God. And it is important for us to realize the greatness of this grace of God. And I will refer back to what was said in the breaking of bread, the passage that says that the grace of God is sufficient to us. How can we understand this verse? How can we accept this verse when people are telling us, are encouraging us when we are going through difficulties of life, that all we need is the grace of God. If you don't experience that in your life, it's just empty words. But when you experience the grace of God, and you are going through that war in life, those temptations, those, those storms of life, when one reminds you of the grace of God, you say, ah, yes, I know where my help comes from from. And when we read the scriptures like this, 
like we have here in chapter 14, it shows us how important we are for one another. Each one of us is important for the rest of the church. Whoever you are, even if the devil tells you are not important, where well, God says you are, and that's what's important. What God says, you are significant. You are useful in the body of Christ. And as we see in this uh, passage, verse 14, Paul is addressing this church, and he is confirming, I myself am satisfied about you. Imagine this, Paul the Apostle is speaking to this church, and he's telling them, I am satisfied with you. Now, it must somehow they must have been living the gospel of grace. No, we know that they had opposition. We know that they had false preachers and teachers among them. That's why he is writing this letter to put some things right. But they had certain characteristics that is good for us to have as well. For example, he says, you yourselves are full of goodness. What a characteristic that we can have. Can I say to myself, honestly, I am full of goodness. It's not a matter of pride. It is not out of saying, oh, how good I am. Or project that I am a good person. But inside, I know that I am not. Who I am, before the eyes of God, before the Spirit of the Lord, it means I have a good heart sanctified by the Holy Spirit. I am good, and my goodness given to me by God is building up the church of Jesus Christ. Another thing he put points out to them is that they are filled with all knowledge. It doesn't mean they know all theology and have all um, understanding, no, but the verb there and the way that it is written, it is showing that they have a base of knowledge. They are not satisfied with that base of knowledge and they want to know more. And this is another question we need to ask ourselves because many Christians, for example, they know there are 10 commandments in Exodus chapter 20, and they are satisfied with that. I know that there are 20, uh, sorry, 10 commandments in chapter 20 of Exodus. And I'm satisfied with that. No. If I want to apply that word for me, it would mean I know there are ten commandments, but how do they affect my life? What do they teach me about God? What do they teach me about myself? What do they teach me about others? It means they have a base of knowledge, but they want to increase their knowledge because that increase of knowledge is not just mental ascent, but it is a, a way of how the spiritual life is growing and developing. It is also important to realize that these people, the church in Rome, made up of Gentiles and Romans together, and of course the church of us today, they are also able, they have the ability to instruct one another. Notice the church is to instruct one another. I've been saying for many months before COVID came along that we need to look at the New Testament and see what we are doing is in the Bible. It doesn't mean if it's not, it's wrong, but at least we must look at the Bible and see what we are not doing. And one of the things I've been mentioning over and over again, not one person in the church is above the other. We are all members of the same body and the only one head, and that's Jesus Christ. We all have different responsibilities. That is true, but that doesn't make 
one more important than the other. In fact, the more responsibilities you have, the more of a servant one must be. And when we see these people are able, it means they are already doing it. Their behavior, the way of church, the way they do church is to help each other, instruct one another, correct one another, build one another. The idea of having one person on the pulpit and preaching to everybody, it's how it developed. Yes, there must be a preacher, there must be a teacher, but it, that's not an exclusive gift. Each one of us needs correction. Each one of us needs guidance in life. I was talking with a brother and uh, um, some time ago, and this brother said that, yes, I also have doubt in my life. Now, who on earth doesn't have doubt? We all have doubts. I have doubts. Don't be scandalized by me saying it. I have doubts. Sometimes I doubt if I should have taken this journey of 30 years of being a pastor and educator. I look back and see my old friends. They are, some of them are millionaires today. We did the same job, the same factory. And I say, oh, I should have taken that job, not this job. Oh, but the good thing is this. God guided my life somehow. Him, he did it. Well, he, because he's God. Because looking back, I, how on earth? A person like how I was ended up in this responsibility. But it is a responsibility. It's not something to glory over people. It is not a position where one looks down over others. We are one. And we all, know, we all need each other so that we can all grow in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of the grace of God. This is the gospel of grace that God has given us. We don't deserve nothing except the pit of the fiery hell. But God instead gave us the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that wonderful? And we are walking together in this wonderful journey. Holding hands with one another. Instructing one another as Paul is saying here about the church. Paul speaks about himself as being a... a, a um, actually, verse 15, it says, But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder. Not by arrogance, but Paul was bold in his words because he knows the importance of his words. He was proud, and we, mentioned, we, 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 we heard the, as, as also the word today, he was proud, he boasted. But not on his ability, he boasted about what God was able to do in his life. That's a great testimony. It's not about us. It's not about our personal achievement. But it is about the grace of God, the power of God that has used sinful people like us to move forward the gospel of grace. That's what Paul was proud of. Verse 17, I believe that is. He said, 16, 17. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. His intention was whatever he was doing, he was doing it for God and not for his position. Not for his pride. He was doing it for God. And that humbles us. That keeps us low. It keeps giving us a heart of servanthood. Paul says in verse 16 that he is a minister, a servant of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That's how he saw himself. And I've told you last week there are several words translated minister or servant, you know, they are different in their Greek meaning, but it shows us 
Basically, it shows us that anyone that claims he's a born again and he is saved by this powerful gospel, that doesn't make him anyone, you know, super-powered evangelist, but makes him a humble servant for the Lord. And this is what we need to seek for. This is what we need to search our hearts for. We've already been challenged this morning to search our hearts. And this is a, a challenge that we need to do every single day. Challenge our hearts and say, where is my heart? Is it with God? Is it with me? Is it with my ministry? Which are different. Yes, of course, your calling is important. But it must be bound with God's voice, with God's heart. Your heart is not independent from the heart of God. You need to have your heart in God's heart so you can understand why God has called you for whatever he has called you. Verse 18, Paul says, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, and by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way to Elucorum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. In these verses, we, write, we find that God gave a vision to Paul. And I can somehow identify with this, God gave him a vision in steps. And now he sees here that this time of his ministry, his apostleship has come to an end. He says, now I've done my preaching in Judea, in Eastern Europe, up to Albania. Albani now he wants to go to Spain, to the other side of the Mediterranean. That's his plan. He wanted to know what God's steps are. Now, we know, we know that as far as we know, at least, he never went to Spain. But he wanted to go to Spain. But God had other plans for him. He never mentioned Malta, but he ended up in Malta. He wanted to go to Rome, but not in the way he arrived. You see, but that was God's plan for him. But the point is, he was not... Someone who says, okay, when I see some, some burning bush or some voice coming from heaven, like he had, anyhow, I will move on. No, he learned his lesson. He kept on moving. He knew that that part of his mission is nearly over. Now, what's next for me? Maybe I come to Rome and before I go to Spain. That was his plan. Like he wanted to go to Macedonia and uh, he was stopped to go. I mean, he wanted to go to Iconium, but he went it up in, in Macedonia. He came into Europe. So, brothers and sisters, as our time is uh, already run, Paul, in this passage, gives us quite a, a strong overview of how Christians should live their lives and as a church. As a church, we had the instruction started from chapter 12. As personal life, it is based on our inner values and what God wants from each one of us. What's God's plan for each one of us? Your plan, the God-given plan, is important for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, when he was doing this ministry, he considered himself as, as an apostle to the Gentiles. And he offered these Gentiles, metaphorically of course, as a living sacrifice. He offered them as an accepted sacrifice. And how was that sacrifice acceptable? It tells us at the end of 16, verse 16, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Sanctification. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the main doctrines of our salvation. Sanctification. We must allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life. 
In our theology, we believe there are two stages of sanctification. The first one is the complete one that Jesus has already paid for on the cross. Our faith in him cleanses us from all our sins. But that there is the continuous sanctification. The one that we start to say no to our ungodliness, no to worldly passions, as we learn to live more our life for the glory of God, displaying his holiness. And there is, there is a time for the church to show the holiness of God is today. When we live in an island, we live in a world where sin has become the norm and holiness has been something which people um, become uncomfortable with and actually mocked in just a few years. In just a few years. God knew that this was going to happen. And guess what? That's why we have the Holy Spirit. His power never changes. The power of the Holy Spirit is never weak. What is weak in this combination is us. But the power of the Holy Spirit is still there. So let us, brothers and sisters, get again plugged with the Holy Spirit. If you've never been plugged with the Holy Spirit, it's about time. It's about time to ask God to fill you with His Spirit, to be empowered by His Spirit. That's the point of chapter 1-8 of Acts. Soon we will be um, celebrating uh, Pentecost. The power of Pentecost never stopped. It always was there. The church lost it because of its sinful and pagan behaviors, but it was always there. And it's still here today. And those people, you and I, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, we have this responsibility to keep preaching to the Gentiles. Those people, which later we may associate them with unbelievers. Those who do not believe in the holiness of God. They may believe in a God. They even may mention the God of the Bible. But you would know if they believe in Him by the fruit of their life. And I use that singular, fruit of their life. So, brothers and sisters, let us first be those who are asking these questions to ourselves, examining ourselves to make sure that we are in this wonderful faith, the faith that is empowered by the grace of God. So, as we come to an end to this chapter, and God willing, next week we'll have chapter 16, another beautiful chapter. Something, I used to think it's a boring chapter because all, the, all, all of those names there until I started studying it. So I pray that as we come to this practical part um, and ending next week, then ending it, starting to end it next week, and see the importance of ministry to the church. If there is one thing we shall learn from chapter 16, is a, a continuous of chapter 14 and 15. The importance of people ministering to the body of Christ. God bless you all, and thank you.